So just want to introduce uh, this session called Bringing Data into Space, Communication Standards from Physical Signage to Spatial Computing. Uh, my name is Nick Kaufman. I'm Community Manager for in situ. Um, and uh, we've got Adrian Schmokert and uh, Du uh, uh, here as well. I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. And then we've got an opening exercise for you. Hi, everyone. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Adrian Schmoker, and I uh, wear many hats, but today I'm wearing the hat of strategic partnerships for a social enterprise called Helpful Places. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do in just a moment, but as Nick mentioned, wanted to kind of start things out by turning things over to you. Um, we had a few questions. A lot of what we do at Helpful Places is help people demystify the black boxes on the street. So this is a gray box, not a black box. I was walking around downtown Brooklyn yesterday in preparation for a walking tour that we're leading tomorrow morning. Um, you're welcome to join us. There's still sp spots available and the weather should be a lot better <laughs> than it is today. But wanted to start out just to see what this inspires for you. And what I mean by that is what kind of questions do you have? If you're walking down your street, you see this, what do you notice and how does it make you feel? Does it make you nervous? Does it make you indifferent? What kind of questions do you have? What is this thing doing? Um, what kind of data is it collecting, if any? Just kind of curious to hear kind of what comes to mind. So walking down the street, my first thought, um, seeing the NYC logo, I would automatically understand it belongs to the city somehow. I'm not so sure that I would be concerned, quite definitely curious as to what the purpose of it is. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And I have a few other photos to share, so there'll be more opportunities to, to chime in. Uh, was there another question? No? Okay. So how about this one? Does this inspire a few different thoughts and feelings? Do you feel the same way as the little gray box, maybe a little differently? saw a few interesting facial expressions. <laughs> what comes to mind? Go ahead. We're not sure, like, what is it, a camera? Is it an air sensor? Is it measuring how they should look? Yes, great questions. What is this? Maybe this, maybe that, maybe, yes, exactly, exactly. And the last photo I'll share, this is all in downtown Brooklyn on Fulton Street. So there's a few different things happening here. You have the street lamp, but then you also have this like trifecta of something happening here. Any questions, any thoughts, reactions? Yeah, go ahead. With the last two images, they seem like a lot more privatized. Um, I mean, city might still order outbreak just devices, but with the first one, it's like very clearly deep, like public property. I think it's a water meeting, but these, it like, I know we're all of it is, we're citizen, like you don't know where the data's going, who's collecting it. Great, great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to my partners at in C2. They have a few images to share also, and then we'll share a bit more. But thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Adrian. Um... So just to continue, uh, but maybe slightly different question this time. Uh, what types of data, data points, can you spot in the following images? This isn't the first one. Um, anyone? And if you don't know exactly what type of data, maybe where where would it be found? What what part of the image shows might show some open data or any data? Anyone? Yeah. A building printed somewhere on the side. Where, where would you look for that if you imagine that there might be one along the... Walk around the perimeter and check the whole perimeter. Um, okay, next one. How about this one? Any... Uh, Data, how would you figure out what's going on here? Uh, 
We see some street markings, couple signs. Anyone? The engine number. Oh, Great. Yeah. Fire department right here. Um, so this will lead into, uh, talking about the invisible. So Ad Adrian showed, uh, some hardware that you can see on the street, but the invisible part might be what's inside, what's it doing? Uh, what about the data that is totally invisible on the street? So this site is actually a site we toured last summer, and it is the site of a building permit that was filed, but no construction has started. And it's going to be a building that replaces this uh, warehouse on the right. Uh, but how would you know about this if you hadn't dug into the open data set, if you're just on the street? There's no way to actually know about it yet. Um, and this is one of the sites that we visualized in augmented reality. Um, and uh, so we're going to have two half presentation. First, Adrian is going to talk about helpful places. And then Ta, um, senior data engineer for Institute is going to talk about how we use open data. And I'm going to talk about our design uh, strategy. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you for indulging us with, with your questions and comments. As Nick mentioned, you know, we, we were really excited to do this panel together because in a lot of ways, both in C2 and Helpful Places have very similar missions in trying to demystify a lot of the questions, invisible parts of our city um, that we find on the streets. And so I'll share a little bit about how Helpful Places goes about this. Um, I shared earlier my name, Adrian Schmoker. I do strategic uh, partnerships for Helpful Places. I'm also a senior fellow at the GovLab um, and used to work in New York City government. Um, so I had a role to play in Open Data Week, spent a lot of my time and energy on New York City Open Data. So a huge fan of all of the conversations that are happening here today and really glad to, to be here with you all. And so to come back to Helpful Places, it's a Toronto-based social enterprise. You can see the, the mission statement here. Um, we believe that people have a right to information about what's happening on their streets. And there are a lot of different ways that um, our team goes about doing this. The primary way is by helping primarily city governments, but also other place managers adopt and implement an open source resource called Digital Trust for Places and Routines. And I'll share more about what this is and how we do that in just a moment. But just to kind of come back to the prompt for today of how does data show up in space, we believe that, you know, that this is already happening because our cities are already, they already have this digital layer, this digital infrastructure. We already saw some photos that, you know, I took in downtown Brooklyn just yesterday morning, other photos um, that in C2 shared. And these are examples that I'm sure look pretty familiar. We don't have as many of these robots in New York City, but I saw some in Austin last week. I've seen them in Miami. Like they're definitely floating around our cities these days. Um, but so despite the fact that, you know, digital technology is increasingly embedded, we still don't know that much about them, as was kind of demonstrated through our, our questions earlier. And, you know, I think uh, there, there was a really good point made by uh, this woman in the, the audience up front here is that the, the gray box we saw, you know, there was a sense that, oh, I, I know who, who's in charge of this. There's NYC written on it. But the others, not so much. And, and we find that that's generally the case with these technologies. Who is responsible for this technology tends to be one of the biggest questions. And it's not always very clear. And we know that communities care about this. People have questions, they have doubts, they have theories, they have fears. And we think that it's really important to address these. Um, there have been some efforts made. I don't want to act as though nothing is being done. There's more and more local legislation, depending on the country you're operating in. There's also national legislation and of requiring notice, consent, and accountability. But the way that that goes about, the way that it shows up for the end user, if you will, the pedestrian on our street, is very inconsistent. I'm sure that you've seen varying ways of how information is or is not communicated even that gray box that was shown earlier, it said NYC on it, not much more than that. And even then it was kind of hard to decipher, right? 
And so this is a, a quote from one of our partners from our first pilot of DTPR on the ground in the summer of 2020 in Boston, um, kind of sharing how from a city government perspective, there's she, she's admitting that, you know, they rely more and more on new technologies, but it's essential to make sure that there's this cultural awareness and investing and engaging in communication tools and public processes. But the big question is how? And so that that's where our work comes in. We really believe that um, as much as I think everyone here is what I might call like a data fan, it is not something that is intuitive to everyone. So just kind of making data itself um, the only thing that's available, we didn't think was sufficient. We do believe as a part of what we do at Helpful Places that we need both a data chain, a data standard, and I'll share more about that in a moment, but also a visual communication system. Um, as humans, I would arguably say, like we're, we're familiar with these kinds of ways of communicating, stop signs, um, accessibility, signage. These are all things that mean things now in a more and more universal language. Nutrition facts, understanding what's, what makes up something. These are all components that we've built into DTPR. So this is out of the ultimate sense of the visual standard that we have, is there's a series of icons. We literally have an icon for pretty much every type of technology that we've found in public space. And we work with place managers to identify the correct one to place in the segment of this is really the core of through our research of what we've found the public user wants to know. They want to understand the purpose of the technology. Who is in charge? Who is in charge of this technology? Is it New York City government? Is it someone else? What is the technology and what is it doing? Is it collecting data or not? Is it de-identified data? So the entire kind of data layer to the technology. And then how do I provide feedback? How do I learn more? And so this is always a QR code that takes you to the nutrition label behind the technology, which we call the data chain, and enables you to provide feedback to the one that's accountable. So this is just kind of photos from how DTPR was developed. And these are just some examples. So we're working in a few different countries around the world. These are examples of signs in Sydney, Australia. So you can see that, well, they put the DTPR logo, which is exciting, but otherwise, um, if you're close enough, you can actually scan the QR code and kind of see what the experience is and kind of how this shows up in their public spaces. So they're taking the DTPR standard, adding the correct icons, and helping create this sense of a universal visual language to help people understand what the technology is. And for, po and for folks who... Um, want to learn more, they can see the nutrition label, right? When you buy a box of cereal, you don't always check the nutrition label. But if you have an allergy, you probably do. So it's kind of similar. If you have very strong feelings or concerns about the way a certain technology is going to show up in public space, you have the option of checking the nutrition label. These are a few other examples of what we're doing in Sydney. So, you know, here's a technology that, um, um, you know, take some biometric data, you have some uh, technology that's really focused on work in the environment. So you can see kind of the different variations based on the technology types and also the different kind of accountable organizations as well. This is an example because these QR codes are kind of far away of what you see when you scan the QR code. So there's no app. This is just you take your camera, you scan the QR code, and you're able to really dig in to this nutrition label. And you provide feedback at the bottom on this kind of emoji spectrum of how the whole thing makes you feel. And we encourage all the, the best practice that we say for the open standard is for folks to create a way to get in touch. So whether that's 311, an email address, a phone number. These are just some places where we're operating. We also just kicked off work in Portugal in the UK, and we're about to, um, we're getting ready to do work in Paris as well. Um, I think for, for folks who work in government and might be thinking about this through a different lens, one thing that we've seen with the city governments that we do work with is DTPR is a really nice way of integrating traditionally siloed work streams. 
So we're finding that it's a great way to bring the communications person to the table, the IT person to the table, the Department of Transportation that manages that street pole um, and or has that technology out in the street in a way that they haven't really been having these conversations before. So there's this other layer of impact that DTPR is having in terms of helping governments actually work better in managing this technology layer that exists in public space. Yeah, so these are just some things we've heard from some of our partners in terms of what they've heard from their constituents and how DTPR has, has helped them. Um, yeah, we're getting recognized here and there, which is really nice for us. But otherwise, I'll, I'll pause there. I, I'm really keen to, to dig into thoughts and questions you all have, but going to pass it over to our partners at NC2 to share a bit more. Thank you so much. And Adrian, what can people do to get involved? Oh, that's a great question. We have a Slack channel that you can join. Um, and then otherwise, uh, as mentioned a bit earlier, we have these two walking tours that are taking place tomorrow, one in downtown Brooklyn at 11 a.m. and one in the East Village at 2 p.m. We're going to be walking through and pointing out the invisible city. Um, and so we're really keen to and hopefully do more uh, in New York. And as a big part of that, we wanted to really start by walking the streets. So. Um, I have a card also, if you want to get in touch, stay in touch and, and learn more. Awesome. I think Health and Places and NT2 are both on LinkedIn and that's where we the RSVP for the tour tomorrow. So look, so, uh, search us up on LinkedIn. Uh, I know we all came for the data and I want to get you there as quick as possible to this presentation, but I need to set some context for what is in situ. Uh, so Institute is a startup uh, started about three years ago by founder Donna Chermesh, uh, and we're on a mission to bring the future of cities to life in augmented reality. Um, and so basically what we do is we take design and planning data and create accessible smartphone-based AR experiences of buildings and infrastructure that can be viewed at the building, neighborhood, district, or city level from the street uh, in the palm of your hand. Um, and so I want to talk just a little bit, having just come off the uh, DTPR discussion about our design, how it's evolved, our signage, and how we communicate the invisible digital layer of the future. Um, and then we'll get to the what open data we use to create that later. So um, I already spotted a, a couple things that we have in common with uh, Helpful Places Design Standard and a couple of things that we could probably do to be more conform more with it. I think we did experiment a little at the beginning in integrating the standard, but uh, we worked very hard to uh, reduce the friction to and uh, enlarge the uh, amount of people who can experience uh, the visualizations that we serve through QR codes. We use cross-platform QR codes that can go to both iOS and Android. And we also aspire to not rely on an app. And so we serve them through instant app and app clip associated with um, our app. And so some of the considerations we had to think about on the street are uh, for the digital layer, how do we communicate that this is official public data that we're using? Um, how do we communicate where you have to look to see something new? Uh, we are trying to create something that's better than what we have now, which is uh, planning permit information that's usually placed on the uh, construction facade. So how can we do that better? Um, and we came up with a, a few ways of uh, doing that. The other side of our design set of consideration is how do the buildings actually look in 3D? How do we communicate a future building that hasn't always been totally designed yet um, and some of the ways it might affect you? So um, our AR is anchored using geospatial API on the street. Uh, we design our buildings purposely to be monochromatic and not totally finished architectural wise. We're dealing with permits that are architecture that's not totally finalized. And so we use a deliberately neutral uh, tone to show the buildings, but we try to show the relevant attributes in the permits, which I will get to more later. Uh, and uh, for this on-street signage, we iterated a lot on various types of decals. We ended up with the street decal uh, that says, this is an older one that says changes are coming to this area, scan to see an augmented reality. Um, and we ended up with the one on the right here, 
So some of the changes we ended up making uh, were one, adding an angled top to the decal to point people in the right direction when they start up uh, the visualization. This is like from inside, captured from the AR. Um, and then we also found that, uh, I think this one says, yes, yeah, so see, the, see this future development site in 3D uh, used to be, we used to say, see them in augmented reality. We found that less people actually click through when it said augmented reality. We don't really know what that is yet. Uh, when we say see it in 3D, that's a lot more understandable. Um, and so that was one one change that we made. Um, very open to people's thoughts on how we communicate that there's something here that hasn't been built yet and it's sometimes not even under construction yet. Um, so our principles for AR, uh, why we chose AR is accessible, it's intuitive, uh, and it's empowering. Uh, we think it's empowering because you see it from your perspective. It's in your hand. You're holding it. You're not looking at something on a table in a conference room where there's a difference between you and the people presenting it to you. Um, and we want it to be accessible as possible with using what's in your pocket. But we realize there is still a digital divide. One of the reasons why we think smartphones are better than uh, Apple Vision Pro or you know glasses that are coming out is that you can actually see see it over someone's shoulder. So we've noticed that there's a bystander effect that people are able to view, look on with someone else to see what they're seeing. And that's very important for engagement. Um, so some of the AR capabilities that we're trying to match with what data we can show in space are, we use text pop-ups on our buildings. We've done slider elements and animated construction processes which can show different types of data about a project. Uh, we can switch between the real scale of the project and a tabletop scale where you could do it remotely if you're not on site. Um, we have done some data visualization such as live shadow casting uh, based on time of day. You could see where shadows would be cast uh, and uh, custom interactions as well. Uh, like uh, we did a wildlife overpass outside of LA, visualized it and showed which animals would be using it. Um, and this is sort of the pipeline that we used and we start with open data or data from architects and planners to create location-based AR. And this gets me to open data, finally. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tara to talk about how we use that in New York. All right. Thanks so much, Nick, Hadrian. That's a great um, segue for me. I guess so, like we kind of just shifting the year a little bit to talk about like uh, data stuff now. Uh, first of all, I'm, to, uh, I'm the data engineer, senior data engineer on the institute team. But I think what I sort of see our sort of city theme come together is, um, I think you should be probably convinced by the, like you see it equals <laughs> the next uh, demos of our, um, it's very visual, right? It's very striking. Like you, you see immediately how that's like a better way to represent the data and the spaces, like you immediately like grabs your attention and brings you into it sort of, right? And I, and I think what I can talk about is like, since I joined the team to institute like last summer, how my work sort of reflect that reality, sort of with a little bit of a gap to the reality of where open data is at and where we can go, you know, with the new, like what health what places are doing or institutes are doing. So um, I'm gonna walk you through basically my experience. <laughs> and so last summer, when I was approached by Dana, who is uh, our you know uh, co-founder in situ, but also a good friend of mine. Like we went to planning school together, and she showed me this map. Like she showed me this like New York City map with thousands of projects uh, already like visualized. Uh, you can just scan the QR, you see the model, and you can also see the map. Right now, this is showing you all the different projects. Like each tiny icon there is an actual project, development project. And she's like, I think I have some question. I know. Uh, you work on, uh, like you are a city planning, I see some my <laughs> city planning folks here. Uh, and, uh, I have some questions. Can you tell, can you help me answer them? And I was like, great. I, I actually work on the underlying data, data set that you are showing me right now. I was like, I worked three years in the first, in the housing economic development team. And also then later I had the data engineering team, uh, both at city planning and uh, I actually work on the, the, the was part of the team that work on the development data set. 
uh, which is part of the open NYC open data. And uh, yeah, it's basically tracking from the DOB permits, job application data, combined with certificate occupancy, like basically can show you all the past developments and oncoming developments that's happening in New York City. Like, I was like, this is great. Like, because I worked on this for three years, I don't know, like, there's more than that's LP5 right into actually saw the data set. <laughs> because I know we have a great open data ecosystem where you can, like, there's all kinds of Scrata API, you can download SSB, so available in shape files, you know, where all data people here, we all know the drills, but like to see it on a map visual like, like this, and anyone can just use their smartphone and to access it. I, I was like, that's, that's perfect. That's great. That's my dream. <laughs> and, uh, and then basically, uh, again, like to show you, like I, I was on this tour. So then I was walking a bunch of uh, people that sign up for our tour around and telling them, Hey, like if you have this QR, uh, you can actually like, uh, ask us, request the QR from us. And if you, you know, a project exists in the development database, you just request to us, like, can I have the QR please to this project? And you can actually just like go there and, you know, place the QR and everyone now can access it, the, the, the product through their phone. And, uh, yeah, there's available for again thousands of uh projects in New York City at the time and um Dan really asked me a question like can we just replicate this across different cities like she's like since you said you built this data set or you are the part of the team that built this like development data set can you can we just do this for every U.S. cities then and uh, I was like that sounds really hard I see five ways that wouldn't work but uh, I'm in <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, so long story short, we kind of did it. Yeah. So we're, we're, I th think we, we, yeah, we did it. Uh, we now have dozen on board dozens of new U S cities into our system where you see here, Riley, Seattle, Austin, and, uh, yeah, and each one don't have a map or public maps. So you can actually just go to our URL. Uh, and you can see this map and you can, if you visit those cities on the street, you can just like experience them in QR in their real size. And they are all sort of oncoming developments based on the permit data. And of course they're like, like I said, challenges getting those data in the first way. That's what I sort of want to talk about a little bit here. Um, and, and, and we, we actually like, um, create reports for each other city, like show you exactly what we did where we got the data, uh, walk them through, uh, our like processing process, filtering process to get to our final, uh, number of projects and give some, like trying to give some constructive feedbacks to, uh, each of the open data related to construction, um, to those cities. Um, so that's sort of the underlying layer of the data that's beneath the, the visualization, the AR. Uh, the, that we just see a second ago. Um, and I think what, what I sort of want to make a case for here is, uh, you're not actually supposed to see the detail on this page. <laughs> I post this here. This is actually the real, uh, or the, the actual filtering process. Uh, so each of the boxes you see is a like small flow charty thing that you're seeing is the filtering process for each of the city to get to the endpoint that actually can be placed on the street because, um, and you, and you will be aware of the oncoming developments that's coming to your like sort of city environment, urban environment. And I just want to show you be, again, not to let you see all the details, but you can see kind of just based on this, you may see like the, uh, the variation, right? That's, that's like striking, like how different each city. Like this is Chicago, this is Riley, uh, and Mesa, Arizona, Tucson. So like they are all major city and they all have excellent open data. So I actually went through top US 50 based on 2020 census population, top 50 US city. And I look at their open data, each one of them. <laughs> and I, I choose the ones that have the best open data that we can do this on, but still you see the variation. So like. That's what I wanted to say 
uh, you know, why is something like GCPR is so great because we have to get to think about like as data practitioner and the open data engineers and uh, well, who publish open data to think sort of early on the design and standards that we are publishing this data set for. I titled the slides to answer a simple question because it's really a very simple question we ask <laughs> at CTO. We're like, uh, show me, I know you publish permit data set. I know you publish like DOB job application zoning data set. Uh, the very simple question is we want to get the new construction, major significant developments that's coming to the city. Uh, it has to be relevant, so you, you can be expired or like you, the work can be stopped. There's no issue with the permits, and there are uh, it has to be um, somewhat in like a walkable neighborhood. Maybe like that's our preferred destination, uh, and uh, it's prefer like yeah, like it's just, it's any sort of significant new construction. Uh, but to answer that simple questions, the steps have to going through to get to that endpoint. Is is very different city to city, and uh, here I zoom in on one. This is Washington D.C. Again, that should really give you all the details about, like, show you the steps that that is like completely, almost completely different for each city, just to get to the new construction that we need to get to at the end. Um, again, we kind of we kind of did it, but the, this is why we are, I think. For me, really a lesson learned is how can we um, have a, a standards that's across the different cities, across the nation. Um, even if I'm not arguing for uh, to have all the city's data standardized, even just building permits data, right? Like that's crazy. I know each city have their own uh, idiosyncrasy. I work on the New York City data. I know how much it can be different from probably every other city and every other city probably have their own characteristic legacy system, all that. But again, if we, when we design open data uh, to answer some, like knowing the user are looking for a very simple answer to their very simple question, uh, then we can really think about like, how do we design this to be much more sort of user friendly? And then, you know, when we, we are the data users, right, or the the the, the uh, people who uh, or the general public are trying to use the data, they have a much easier time to get to their uh, simple question. Yeah. Um, again, yeah. So that slides here, uh, just some general learnings. Again, like data standardization. Right, so go over that. Um, and one other, the second point there is like grade two building matters. I sort of really want to give credits to the you know the data engineer like open data community here in New York City I learned a bunch from city planning data engineering team really like I basically took that the methodology I learned there took it on the road and uh, it just worked shockingly well for all the different systems uh, across the different cities in the US so like like I just showed you there are dozens of cities that uh, the same uh, tools that we build um, called the data library really worse in different places. And I would say, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to <laughs> take those tools that you work with most of the data, open data standards. They're always like, I guess the, like for this is like almost for myself, like data engineer look first um, in the data open source community because you know the last point sort of also goes into that. Like you can check there are places we all share this community of open source technologies that you can just take people's wheel and <laughs> put it on your car and then you can drive it. Um, so that's the one lessons here. And uh, yeah, let's sort of just want to end with that. And it's, again, like this is more talk about the underlying, underlying layers of the data that's supporting the visualization. And but you, I think in our case, you can see like how that's all ties together, you, you can't really have one without the other. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have for you today. Thanks. Thank you. I know lunch is coming up, so we wanted to like give you back a little bit of time and maybe invite discussion to come up and gather around and we can just talk around the table. Uh, but very much open for questions. And also, 
if you have any ideas, like the, the data sets that you work with, what parts of those, what attributes would be, could be spatialized, could be seen in 3D or in out in space. Uh, I think that would be really interesting to learn from more from your experiences. So thanks. Hope to meet you. And if you have a project that you're involved in, that maybe is a future project or street redesign or anything, whether it's official or something you're proposing from a community group, uh, we help visualize them. So come chat to us. Yep. Thanks. The idea of our equation like to internet to a tick like that's if they call it to you, it visualize about I don't know. To realize that the Benga needs to like it, but to go at the origin, what that is of the memory, it will turn over the wheel feedback on Google Show, Thread, and it did that on Google Show. Like, I mean, well, I'm saying that I'll stay too. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we. Uh, so if you, your question was basically like, how might you access the data that these sensors are collecting? If you can uh, show the result in real time of the data. Mm. Uh, oh. actually, like, do you mind anything what I will do or is in, based off some um, new air pension center of land clutch code? I'd be happy to have in real, in real time Access to the data because in the data set from the ceiling, I think it's aggregating the data over like that accurate. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it. I love hearing the demand for what people want to see in their streets and what kind of data you want to have access to. I know that with the cities we work with, there's just as I mean, to mention like the quality of data in different places <laughs> varies so widely. And then there's also with the work we do at Helpful Places, there's also sometimes a gap between like, the city government and the vendor that's providing the technology. So it also depends on what the agreement is there, right? Um, like what is the data sharing agreement? Is that data even shared with the city? If so, can it also go up on their open data platform if they have one? So there's a lot of and of what if, I'm sure if we could have zoomed in, what you could have seen in like Tuz flow charts of if this, then that, and you know, the the data journey, I guess, behind that technology. But thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure, I mean, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, again, like totally, I, that would be amazing, first of all, like can see the air quality data, <laughs> AR in real time. That's, uh, yeah, that, that, that would be the dream. and and. I would say that like, um, yeah, and to sort of go back to the point, I know like sort of we are, um, this is the the school of data and uh, uh, we are talking about OIC data, but I think like one of the lessons I really learned from doing the exercise I sort of did at Institute was like, sometimes it's really helpful to look out other places and uh, sort of think about um, and again like each city is different like we can't ignore that but um i think as a data practitioner across the world right in dcpr's case right like if we can think about those things even just when we start to think about building a new data set start to collect data even uh and set up the standards set up the the specs and uh to make it as sort of standardized as possible <laughs> That goes a long way for sort of the end users and uh, visualizing the data, and so I, I think that 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 would be my takeaway. You know, if I I can, yeah, <laughs> I can say one thing that I learned from the process. Yeah, I did I did learn about another project that's here. I think they have a session called like FloodNet, and so they're they're visualizing water level, uh, and that's something that we hear a lot from clients uh something they're concerned about we've done some visualization for uh flood mitigation infrastructure like seawall uh visualization to show how high would a wall be there's like a lot of contentious conversations around that infrastructure a lot of times and so being able to see what the subjective experience of it from different places i think is, is a really interesting thing that augmented reality offered affordance of that um but yeah, is there any other questions that want to be on mic? Uh, you can also welcome just to come down and chat as well. So, yeah. Um, there, my question is, this is about the, the brief hours are later signing. 
the two pairs that are they sort of based on trying to build a model based on the, the open data versus from a model and coming from the developer or, or you know, just kind of like yeah uh i'll give it to, to i think like to talk about which attributes create those models yeah um hey tyler <laughs> uh yeah so like uh it is it's both actually yeah so the to answer simply so like we take ac or architecture firms we, when they actually have the models they're usually like bim uh uh models or um there's a few other formats uh, pretty much all the formats that we can like dfps and that we can take into our system and process them and also we from the open data side of things where creating like a rule based models that's where you see like a s sort of very bare minimum uh, intentionally also because we sort of want to convey that's the sort of maybe the intention of the projects but not so much as the actual projects um, and uh, we based on the number of floors the uses of the buildings uh, you know those attributes or uh, yeah those attributes that you can have from like sometimes like we, we take into account like zoning zoning code as well but it's a sort of a rule-based system that we're coming up with those like bare minimum models that we, uh, we we're generating from the open data advice a lot by um, i'm one of the data entry design artists and my project was on the corner oh <laughs> Yeah. Fun to say this is amazing and would have saved me a little bit of a headache if I knew this then. Um, but I guess my question is about is there a long term strategy or plan to get this resource to the people who need it? Like, for example, affordable housing. Um, so, uh, it's to use always aiming to be free to end users to, to use to visualize projects. Uh, we do have a new offering that I could pitch, which is that we're launching something called Institute Pro, which is a licensed tool for a uh, more affordable monthly annual fee to be able to publish your own projects. And so for people who work with 3D already planners or even community orgs that would be able to generate models in SketchUp or something and want to show how they would look and route them on a map, that's a tool that we're coming out with. And uh, yeah, we're hoping that that would be more accessible for um, groups that want to work on, say, safe streets or other projects and experiment with it. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing to watch out for. I think coming out in April 1st ish, hopefully soon. I mean, I think on the subject of NYCHA more broadly, I know from the time I worked in the city, so I was at the chief technology officer's office at first, and then at the office of data analytics and, um, one project I worked on with NYCHA there, even, I mean, it, I think this comes to no surprise, but there were actually a lot of questions about technology and how it was going to be used, um, for what purpose. And so I think that in addition to, Adam, I think your question of like, how can we empower the end user to have access to this information? I think from my lens, it's also how do we empower them to understand what the technologies in and around these spaces are doing? Um, and uh, I, one element I didn't speak to in my presentation was that we are building out an API because we do what we would love to see down the road is kind of these data chains. So like if you imagine that DEP water metering sensor, which was that gray box, like at some point, like if we're able to work with the producer of that technology, we can just codify how they do or do not collect technology, or collect data, sorry, uh, depending on where it's implemented. And you could s imagine like a database of that for like all technologies that exist in public space and making that open and available. So that then even if let's say NYCHA housing doesn't implement a system like DTPR, an end user could, you know, maybe try to do a little bit of matching and understand what that technology actually is doing. I'm mostly from France and mostly the last year TNG. So I have, I have a question about the accessibility of like data and curate space and only you can um, it without bringing it to work on project, but especially seeing data, the data visualization and open space, being the dream to 
think that maybe we could use some of the data that is collected into the experience for like project or it's it's quite the long is so well that we should do our own data collection. See, why do you think it's uh, realistic? I mean, I think it depends on the data that's collected. I mean, I think in C2 is like a fantastic example of like what is possible when a city and a place like really invests in the quality of their data and makes it available. Like you guys wouldn't be able to operate the way you do without New York City open data, right? So I think that there's an interesting question perhaps of like in addition to permit data, like what are the other opportunities for visualization? And you give one example of um, uh, like rising water levels, but I don't know if you've seen other. First of all, I think Adrian's project, it's like helping us ask for things we don't know are there yet, right? So if we can learn more about what data is being collected, then we can launch, you know, open data campaign to get that accessible. And I think that's really cool. Uh, for for us, uh, we see like the limitations of what building permits alone can tell us about upcoming projects. We think there could be a lot more information coming from the builders of these projects. A lot of stuff is in 3D from a really early stage now. Why isn't, why aren't we planning in 3D by default? Why aren't cities, why isn't urban planning in 3D already? We know what's coming uh, down the road in terms of interfaces for that, for viewing that. Um, so even in our sort of business model, we're starting to come up with theories for how you could cross incentivize um, the planners the, and the builders and the developers to provide more than they're, than they're mandated to provide now in terms of uh, so in DC, we, we had a potential project where, uh, builders that would be applying for an accelerated permit through the accelerated permit program in the city would be able to benefit from the augmented reality visualization in exchange for providing the 3d model of the building. And then once that model is provided to the city, we can put that into the public, uh, information. So. I think there's more opportunity to make that available when we can make the argument for like why we should share stuff out early. And I think our case for civic engagement is that when we share details of the project earlier uh, and use these tools, not just for informing people about what's already been decided, but as decision-making tools to do more collaborative urban planning, there's huge benefits there. There's like a lot of fear and a lot of risks that exist, but I think that more and more people are understanding like this could be the difference between a project getting totally scrapped or a project meeting people's needs better. There's some more opportunity to boost the the data we have. So if, I don't know if anyone has thoughts about how we can make urban planning run in 3D by default, very open to that uh, conversation. Yeah, I was curious if you guys had considered, um, you know, as like local laws, I think seven is, is one more relevant around building the perpetration. Is there potentially uh, a civic engagement angle um, around showing us some of the new buildings that hopefully the stream minimum fine or, or whether speed the way of the game thing that can get a private filter well then you know not everyone goes online and checks this out and that might be interesting ways to uh, that maybe it's that yeah I, I i think the the main thing is like the the visualization piece the ar technology have all that capability like it really come a long way in the last couple of years when i see what you see to like why see what you see you have done last year it was like sort of eye-opening for me so like um and uh so yeah so i think it's only a matter of question of where do you find the data and how like yeah it's really only a matter of like uh, data engineering efforts trying to join that once the data is available but again the the sort of million dollar question would be like is that data available and whether it's up to share up to the standards and the granularity you want to see that data right i'm i from my own experience i know the local law like 87 or something right that that requires the like disclosure of your like uh the going energy like you your energy score or something of the to almost like a building level but again like about on top of my head i wouldn't know like whether dob shared that or even if the dob is the right agency right like <laughs> is dob responsible for collecting mm -hmm. i think so but like i'm not so sure about that and that yeah and so to get back to the question of like 
is sort of a data and uh, a communication standard question to me almost. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I've heard of projects where using like an a analysis of 3D map tiles, we can determine like solar potential on rooftops and stuff like that. Very amenable to viewing in 3D. Um, at the same time, I, I don't think everything you like, augmented reality is a particular tool that is good for certain things where you can see line of sight, you can see certain things very well. Uh, it's not, it's just one of the uh, many uh, visualization options available. And I think depending on the use case, it's important to consider like, what is this actually doing? Because uh, one of the reasons like I joined in situ is because a lot of augmented reality projects now are kind of it's for entertainment value or for engagement. It's very engaging. Absolutely. It's, it's super neat, but to actually figure out what is the, like, what could you gain by viewing it this way versus viewing it on a map? It's not like it's going to replace any maps. Like we still use 2d maps. We abstraction is very important for certain things. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's worth like thinking about well, well, what, what is this gain and then how does it interoperate? So we have an API that can serve these codes through existing products. If it's a 3D, like a digital twin software or an existing map layer, we want to like fill in and basically become, the more invisible we become, the more happier we are. So yeah, I think it's, it's a good thing to think about. Um, I know we're at 105, so we'll let people get ahead to lunch, but yeah, feel free to come up chat. Thank you so much.